Well, good morning. Good morning. Again, looks like we've got a break from the rain, so maybe we don't need to uh, break out our blueprints for an arc. <laughs> well, we may have to scrub a little bit of mildew, though. It looks like a beautiful day, so that, that's wonderful. We have uh, a few, I have a, a, a few, three names here that I, I think we need to act before, that we need to be mindful of in the coming week in our prayer time. Baby Scotty continues to do well, as does Aurelia Gibson, and that very much uh, calls for praise and joy, Thanksgiving. Uh, this past Thursday, we heard a marvelous, marvelous presentation from Robbie and Mary Lynn Arnold. And uh, the uh, the exciting things that they're doing and work that they're doing in Cambodia uh, with the education systems of schools there really 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 good. Um, so let's do keep those those folks in our prayers. Uh, I'm sure you may have others on your mind or in your heart, and certainly we will intercede for all of those as well. So let's take some time in prayer before we start. Our dear Heavenly Father, we again come to you mindful of the fact that you are such a loving God, such a grace-filled God, that we are able to be here in this place this morning, and we're able to study your word in spirit and in truth, and that we're able to share that understanding with others without fear of any kind of retribution. And what a joy that is, because we know that there are many places in our world today in which uh, there are people who do not experience that sense of freedom and that sense of joy. So we give you thanks and we would ask that you would help us to be ever grateful for those gifts of grace in ways that might motivate us to share Christ with others who do not know him, to be able to open up to them the truth of your word that they may come to know who you are and come to want that closer walking relationship with you that we experience. We ask especially this morning that uh, we bring to you some folks on our hearts that are experiencing some times some difficulty, but at the same time, they've gone through that dark valley and seem to be coming out on the other side where the sun is shining. And we give you thanks for that and ask that you would be with all of those who are experiencing times of difficulty either in health or for whatever reasons they might be. In those times, it's so easy to lose hope and even in the extreme to lose faith. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit might be very near to them, not just today, but in the coming days, that they might find renewed hope, renewed strength, that they might be able to move forward with their lives, ever grateful to you for all the gifts, all the grace that you give us. We thank you for this church, for the movement that we're seeing in some places. We ask that you would continue to guide us on this journey, that you would continue to motivate us, inspire us, and direct us according to your will. We know how difficult it is for us to understand your word, and that's not you, that's us because we know our limitations of understanding. So open our minds and open our hearts that we might truthfully understand and even more so retain understanding of what those words mean and how those truths that those words define for us may be inculcated in our lives that we might truthfully be better builders with you in, the, in your kingdom here on this earth. Forgive us for those times in which we misunderstand or misinterpret, but always correct us and guide us and lead us, lead us to even deeper understanding. All of these things we ask in the name of our Savior, Lord Christ, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're moving into Paul's letter to the church in Rome, which is a a little bit of a change, but in some ways the, the messages are very, very similar. And here in this particular study today in Romans 8, which is um, one of just several chapters in, in this letter that Paul wrote that just soar 
with meaning and with understanding and quite frankly, with a great deal of beauty in the way in which he uses words to express what it is that he's trying to tell us. This is Pentecost Sunday. So I say happy Pentecost to you. It's not a holiday. It's not even so much as uh, something that we would always mark down on our calendar and look forward to it. I don't even think Hallmark makes cars for Pente Pentecost Sunday. But it's a day of observance. It's a day for us to think seriously about what God in Christ has done for us and what he continues to do for us through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives as it was experienced by those early Christians with the coming of that Holy Spirit. Romans 8 does not have those same lofty uh, visual and auditory kinds of experiences that we see in the second chapter of Acts. But nonetheless, what we have here is, I think, one of the more powerful lessons that we can draw, particularly on this Pentecost Sunday. Ray Stedman, who was a wonderful, wonderful writer, commentator, former pastor, was looking at this particular scripture that we're, we're considering today, and he had this to say. He said that he believed that scripture that's found in 1 John helps us to really clarify the theme of what it is that Paul is trying to communicate to us. Allow me to read it. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. For good or bad, over the years you have I uh, had to experience some of the examples and different things that I use from my background in music. And when I first began studying music as a freshman at Northeast in Louisiana and then transferring to Louisiana Tech, first class I had to take was music theory. I knew absolutely nothing about it. Well, I knew a few things. But in terms of what it was all about, I really did not know. And one of the things that we began to look at very early are foundations of music. What makes music? What, what gives it its structure, its organization? All of those things. Back in the 12th and 13th century, there were mathematicians, for example, who looked at music and saw that it had much the same kind of structure as mathematics. And so we prefer that particular perspective to an understanding of music. And one of the things that we come to realize very early on in music theory, that music, musical compositions are made up of a continuing series of tension and resolution. Meaning that when you listen to music, it makes sense to you because you begin on a you begin on a certain note and then you move through all sorts of other different kinds of notes and chords and different kinds of instrumentation and so forth and then you wind up coming back literally to where you started and an interesting thing about that it's psychological as much as anything else is if we don't make it back to home or what the music theorists refer to as tonic, we feel upset. We feel tension. We feel something that can literally almost make us nervous because we don't have that resolution. Give you a good example. I'm not going to sing Piano's covered. I'm not going to play the piano either. But remember the old shave and haircut thing? Yeah. <laughs> if you stop there, you don't feel like it's finished, do you? You want to hear what? 
that finishes that that completes the circle that ties it all together and we have in that structure of a musical scale we know do re mi fa sol la ti do those indicate the different pitches of the scale but there's another subset of terminology that begins with tonic supertonic median submeet subdominant dominant median and leading tone and those indicate the chords that build upon those do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Does that make sense to you? All right. And so what happens in music when composers write music, and we do it subconsciously when we just go around, my grandfather whistled all the time. And I never knew what he whistled, but it made sense. And we do that because we don't want to leave it in a sense of, in, in a feeling of tension. We want it to resolve. I can give you another little example just from singing hymns. There's a type of chord that's called a plagal chord, and it's built on that fourth, that fourth element in the scale. Plagal refers to, we've called it the amen chord. When we sing the, the doxology, and then we sing amen, that's a plagal chord. Amen, four to one, da, da, da. very, very common. But that gives us that sense of, I'm home. That makes sense. That is really, really, really good. A lot of people have looked at that in terms of a theological application as well. One of those is a guy at Duke University named Jeremy Bagby. Prolific writer, musician, trained musician, professional musician, but also an absolutely marvelous, marvelous teacher, theologian. And he uses some language that a lot of other musicians do as well. He said, in music, you begin with home, then you go away, through a whole range of different kinds of musical notes and rhythms and different instrumentation, voices, whatever. And then we complete the pattern by returning to home again. And so some of those same kinds of feelings occur to us who are people of faith. Because what we are living in is a time in which we know is sort of the in-between time. It's that time in which we know that Christ is coming again. We know that there's going to come a point when all of creation ceases. And so we live for that day. We're in that away kind of thing, if you think of it in a melody. We're still moving our way through this chord, this melody, if you will, called life. And we're striving, striving, striving to get resolution, to get back home. We're not there yet. And to get there, we got to go through a whole lot of other things that, quite frankly, may make us very, very uncomfortable. But it's an interesting thing what God does for us out of his absolutely amazing, remarkable love. He knows that in this away position, we have a hard time. We have a hard time sort of hanging on to that sense of hope that keeps us moving, that keeps us abiding by what God and Christ has taught us to do. So, he knows that in this point in our existence, we suffer. And so for that reason, he has sent us a helper, his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is one that helps us in those away times when we are struggling with trying to make sense out of things and at the same time sustain our faith and sustain our hope. Paul is firmly rooted, rooted in this. He believes all of those things that, and recognizes the fact that now we do suffer. 
but we suffer as much as anything else because of the hope that's within us. It's that tension kind of thing. We take on faith, God's promises, but we're so anxious and, and, and we are not very patient. We want it to happen right now. And Paul is telling us that's not the way God moves. That's not the way God thinks. And as a result of that, we experience a high, high level of tension. Paul uses words here in Romans 8, groanings. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the, pre to the present time. And it's not just us that groans, but it's all of creation, even those non-human aspects of it. A time is going to come within creation in which there won't be any more pollution, there won't be any more species extension, there won't be any more oil slicks on some of our beautiful beaches, all of those things that seem pointed toward damaging or in some cases eternally ruining aspects of God's creation. Creation knows this and Paul sort of teases us a little bit with his language by communicating that kind of understanding. And he does it with absolutely beautiful, beautiful imagery. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That phrase, eager anticipate expectation, is interesting. Literally translated from the Greek, it means to crane one's neck. And, and the image that I have is and I can remember myself doing this. You can remember doing it. You can remember doing it with your children, perhaps even with your grandchildren. You go to a parade and the child is standing there and a band comes by and she all of a sudden stands up on her tiptoes and begins to look, to stretch, to see how much closer she can get to whatever is coming next, the next float, the next group of performers, whatever it might be. And so that's sort of the understanding here that Paul is getting at with eager anticipation. We physically try to strain ourselves, to push ourselves to get even closer, to bring that even quicker into reality so that we can experience it. We just know we don't know when it's going to happen, but in hope and in faith, we know, we don't just believe, but we know that something wonderful is coming our way, and we strain, we stretch, we reach out in anticipation of it, in expectation of it. So that gives us that sense of tension. One more musical thing, then I'm going to back away from the, the musical theory piece of it. You have heard music by Richard Wagner. One of his operas is entitled Tristan and Isolde. And the prelude or the overture to that opera is one of the most magnificent pieces of music that gives you this sense of tension and resolution. And it also comes back to this notion of craning one's neck. There are places in that prelude in which Wagner carries you and he pushes the notes and the chords and pushes and pushes. And you think he's never going to come back to tonic, never going to come home. But eventually when he does, I got to tell you, when you're listening really close and you're, you know a little bit about what he's doing musically, it makes you go, oh, because that resolution is so complete. It is so perfect that 
all the tension, all of the worry, all of the uncomfortable kinds of feelings that you have are completely gone. It even makes you want to smile a little bit. So what Paul is suggesting is that just like experiencing that prelude to Tristan and Isolde and listening for that resolution, we likewise have to feel that. We have to feel that tension that exists within our lives, but always straining, always pushing, always moving forward, knowing knowing that resolution is going to occur. We are going to get, it's all going to come back home just in a matter of time. So faith like this keeps us moving. It keeps us motivated to go forward, not just sit still and wait, but to literally anticipate, expect, and keep moving toward it. It motivates us to do things like work for justice so that others might become partakers of this same kind of experience. It motivates us to be as good stewards of the creation as we possibly can. And then we are also asked to do whatever we can that gives life, shape, meaning, and understanding to whatever is coming, whatever it is that is to be, we want to be ready for it. There are three groanings Paul shares with us here in this scripture. First one he says is nature is groaning. We are groaning. And then he says the spirit is groaning. But he says the spirit is groaning with words that cannot be uttered. In our weakness, in our weak moments, in our weak times, in our suffering times, in our difficult times, we find ourselves overwhelmed by circumstances to certain to the extent that, and I know what you've been there, I have. If you literally, literally don't know what to say. You want to pray, but the words just won't come. You want to speak to God about what's happening in your life. But even if you could say the words, you, you can't put them together to give coherent meaning. It just simply won't come. I, I, can, I can recall moments in which my mind was just absolutely blank. It was just like someone flipped a switch and the lights went completely off. I was worthless, worthless. And so this is the kind of thing that Paul says that we have to do. We have to rely on the spirit. Because the job that the Spirit is going to always do as our helper is to give us the words that we need. And even if we still can't say them, the language of Paul says it all. The Spirit himself intercedes. If that's not cause for a hallelujah, I, I don't know what it is. Because even in our weakest, weakest moments, even as we our faith is challenged, the Holy Spirit is right there interceding for us, helping us in those moments in which we cannot literally help ourselves. So the Spirit is not just sitting on the sidelines like a coach, watching what happens, maybe making some notes here and there, being a little bit of aloof, having a little bit of aloofness every now and then. No, he comes alongside us. 
He, he's right there with us. I'm going to be in Baton Rouge for a couple of days this, this coming week, leave tomorrow, be back Wednesday night. And one of the things I'm working with uh, staff and instructors on down there is this whole thing of instructor assessment. And what I have taught when I've done these kinds of things before is that when you come back to the word, the meaning, the root meaning of the word assessment, it literally means sitting along beside. In other words, when you assess someone, when you're trying to help them get a little bit better, you don't just tell them what they did wrong and tell them what they need to do to make it better. You sit and listen. You give them words that will help them, that make sense to them, that build them up, not tear them down. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. When we're caught in those moments of tension, in which, as I said, like my cases have been, I'm absolutely worthless. Cognitively, I just cannot, cannot function. Unlike Job's friends who sat long and just commiserated with him in silence, Holy Spirit is pitching with us. He's right there with us the all, all the time. And he's doing so with groans that words cannot express. So I think if we were to boil this down, this whole conversation we've had here, I think it would be this, the Holy Spirit ministers to us in our very weakest moments, in our weakest times, by literally entering into our pain, entering into that tension, into that suffering, that difficulty that we're experiencing, and literally becomes a partner and an intercessor with God himself. A website that I encountered some time back, I love it just simply, Our World Belongs to God. Some interesting writing on there. And I came back to a thing that, that's on their site. I gave you the, the source of it down there. And uh, one of the writers was writing pretty much about this same scripture that we're looking at today. And he made reference to what he called tempered, tempered impatience. God knows we are impatient. He made us. He made us. And I suspect there are a lot of times when God smiles when we become so impatient with him. And so this particular writer used the language tempered impatience to mean that we don't settle for the way that things are right now but just like that child at the parade, we keep straining our necks. We keep standing up a little bit higher so we can get a better glimpse. We keep moving forward in eager expectation and anticipation until that final chord that God is going to give to us brings the resolution that our hearts and our souls so desperately desire. So we keep leaning forward. We keep craning our necks. We keep moving until that final hallelujah. So those last two knocks are finally heard and we can say, yes, yes. Thank you, God. We're home. We're home at last, we're secure, and your promise has come to fruition, and I'm a beneficiary of that, and I give you thanks for it. That's a further evidence of the infinite grace that you show to each one of us. So this is a marvelous piece of scripture, and I, I know for myself, 
at, at former times when I've dealt with it, I get so caught up with trying to understand what Paul means by groans that I lose sight of what the better, the stronger, the richer, the more beautiful meaning is that he's conveying here. So I hope that what we've looked at here helps us get that better understanding. Remember, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as paraclete. Par paraclete, not the bird parakeet, paraclete. And that literally means someone who is called to come alongside someone else. It's a trusted friend, spouse, pastor, Holy Spirit himself and those most powerful spiritual moving kinds of experiences that we have. And in that presence, we find comfort to make sense of what's going on around us. That's all I've got this week. Y'all have a good week. I'll be in Baton Rouge, like I said, for three, three days. Pray for me. Rough city down there, plus it's hot as blue blazes. But anyway, I'm looking forward to making contact with some old friends I haven't seen in a while. So I'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. Have a good week, David. You too.